So well, welcome everybody. It's good to see you on this screen. I can't imagine how many little pictures we have, which is terrific. Uh, hope you can see fine. But uh, we're very happy to have Elena Pastorino speak to us today. Um, on our, this may be one of the last uh, economic policy working groups of the summer. We're already into the summer. Um, but the uh, Ellen is a research fellow at Hoover, uh, Department of Economics, and also at CEPA at Stanford. So she really is getting around. We appreciate it greatly. And uh, the title of our uh, talk is very provocative, actually, very short and sweet, Taxing the Rich. Uh, and it's co authored with Chari Pat Kehoe and uh, Sergio Sagallo. And I think some of them may be on. We'll see. And I see John Cochran's on, so that means we're ready to go. And thank you all for joining us. So if you have questions, um, please interrupt. Eleanor will take questions during her talk. We won't save them till the end. So interrupt any time with a question, uh, either through the chat function, raising your hand or screaming, however you want to do it, and we'll watch for you. But, um, but welcome uh, to everyone, and I'll thank you. So uh, if you're ready to begin, go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Thank you, John, for having us today. I'm delighted to talk to you about some work in progress. We'll be Vichari, as you mentioned, at the University of Minnesota with Patrick Keogh here at Stanford, and with Sergio Salgado at the Berta School of the University of Pennsylvania. So what do we do here? In this paper, we revisit the current debate on inequality, which as many of you may know, is centered on the high degree of concentration of income and wealth in the United States. To give you a sense of magnitudes, in terms of the pre-tax distribution of household income, the top 1% of richest households in the United States held approximately 27% of it in 2016. And as for the distribution of household wealth, the top 1% of richest households held roughly 39% of it in 2016. The distribution of household wealth in particular is much more unequal than that of all other OECD countries, in which the wealth share held by the top 1% of the wealth distribution over the same time period ranged between 10 and 25%. Our estimates are based on the SCF, on the US survey consumer finances, but others estimate based on individuals or from different data sources are roughly comparable. Such inequality and its increase over time has spurred an intense debate in the United States about their causes and the remedies for it. Specifically, a number of authors recently have argued that a progressive wealth tax may have a large beneficial impact on the distribution of welfare in a society with effectively minimal or no adverse effects on real economic activity. And I'm thinking here about the work, a large body of work actually by Saez and Zuckman. So the question is, is this conjecture correct? Actually, Anna, can I just interrupt? So uh, there are some big changes over time. Uh, like yes, there are, absolutely. So it's, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. We, we are in the process of addressing them. I, I have a few details about the trend, and we saw a talk here in our series not long ago about some of the uh, dispute or debate in the literature as to the extent to which it actually inequality has increased. As of today, I'm not going to address it, but I'm going to provide to you a framework that is very capable, very much capable of addressing what drove the increase of it over time. I'll talk about it. Uh, in a few slides from now. But for today, I'm going to give you a snapshot of the US at a particular point in time. What, what I'm going to tell you is going to apply and will apply very much to the transition of the economy to the level of inequality in income and wealth that we see. And the mechanism I'll describe to you is behind what we think is the increase in measure inequality in income and wealth as well. So this question is the question in the current debate on inequality in the US. And the purpose of this paper is to address it. And we do so by proposing a novel framework for the study of income and wealth inequality, in which, as you will see, the accumulation of wealth will play a key role as it helps align the incentive of a special class of productive individuals in an economy, managers, executive, and entrepreneurs, with those of firm owners thereby supporting in the aggregate output and productivity growth. 
And this is the critical dimension that the optimal taxation literature has largely ignored. I show you that such a simple model successfully reproduces the distributions of income and wealth in the United States, including their characteristic thick right tails. These distributions are very unequal and highly concentrated at the top. And I'll use this framework to quantitatively evaluate the merits of alternative income and wealth taxes. In particular, we find that wealth taxes distort the incentives of managers to select profitable projects and build a managerial expertise, that is to exert effort in the best interests of the firms they manage and improve their productivity. So they do have a large distortionary impact on an economy, very much in contrast to the presumption of their advocates. So these findings are quite different from what's out there in the literature. So it is important to understand our exercise to evaluate it in the context of the current literature on wealth inequality in economics. So it's fair to say that the literature so far consists of two large strands of work. The first Elena, is- yeah. Elena, uh, just very quickly, the opposite presumably is also true that if in, in economies which didn't have the disparate wealth and weren't aligning incentives, then you would not have got um, the productivity gains, right? Are you Absolutely. also gonna address that? Are you gonna address that? Yes, I'm gonna talk about the upside and the downside. Okay, perfect. But, you know, but like my understanding is in Europe, for example, we don't see this big disparate in income. Um, are you saying that in Europe, they didn't align incentives in the past correctly, and that has resulted in productivity losses? So what I'm going to say is that incentives in a way plays a very important role everywhere. In countries, and I will talk about Switzerland and Norway, in countries that exhibit level of dispersion, not to the extent that the US does, but are comparable to them relative to the GDP, purchasing power parity, where wealth taxes were introduced, we, we see pretty much what our model implies. So I wanted to be fair in the context of the literature, as I said, and help you appreciate what we're trying to do here and essentially provide a model for income and wealth inequality that is a laboratory in which to evaluate the impact of alternative tax and taxation regimes. So the first trend is a very big trend of literature that has focused on the role of entrepreneurs in accounting for the top percentile of the wealth distribution. But an issue with this model is that a sizable fraction of income earned by those at the top of the wealth distribution is actually labor income attributable to executive and managers of publicly owned firms rather than what this model implies to capital income from assets of sole owners. That is, lots of rich individuals in the United States manage publicly held firms that are financed by equity and debt. A second very important strand of the literature has focused essentially on models of incomplete financial markets. So the standard framework here features individuals who supply labor services Stochastical, whose productivity stochastically varies over time. Sometimes it's high and sometimes it's low. And face exogenously incomplete financial markets in that they can only save in a safe bond, which implies that they can insure themselves against labor productivity risk only by saving. But since naturally incentives for precautionary savings tend to taper off at high levels of wealth, these, problem, these models tend to have a hard time at reproducing a robust finding of the data, meaning the observed factor tail of the distribution of wealth than that of income. The distribution of wealth is much more dispersed and concentrated than that of income. This model of incomplete financial markets, as many of you know, can generate a heavy tail wealth distribution once they're augmented with the idiosyncratic returns on investment. That is, once we think of economies of agents that can invest in risky assets. But this class of models is a bit less well known, this fact, starting from Merton and Samuelson and ending with the recent work of Angelatus, Benabib and Bizin, has run into a well-known puzzle. Why don't agents diversify their portfolios? This is in a nutshell, the challenge to the current economic thinking on wealth inequality. How to account for the dispersion of returns in economies in which agents would like to hedge risk. Our approach to this puzzle may come not as a surprise to many of you here, is consists of emphasizing the role of incentives. So our main idea 
is that in order to provide incentives for managers to act in their firm best interest, capital markets must expose managers to their firm's idiosyncratic risk. So manager in our model, you see very much act like investor facing idiosyncratic investment opportunities. This way we resolve the Angeletto Benabib and Bizin puzzle. Managers do not diversify because their compensation contracts are optimally structured to prevent them from doing so. That is, returns on managerial savings are closely tied to the idiosyncratic returns of the firms they manage for incentive reasons. And this is the key mechanism you'll see that makes their wealth and the wealth in the economy spread out. So the key takeaway is that we provide a micro foundation of financial marketing completeness that is capable of explaining both income and wealth inequality. And this is important because to evaluate the impact of taxes, as I mentioned, we need to know what generates the income and wealth inequality that we see. How does our model in practice manage to account for the absurd distributions of income and wealth, but because it gives rise to stochastic returns on assets that do not taper off as they do in standard models as wealth increases. And this is because the agency problem that is at the core of our model, if anything, becomes more severe at high levels of wealth because of standard income effects. So what accounts for our results on wealth taxation? Proponents of wealth taxes reach their conclusion by abstracting from what is, through the lenses of our model, a crucial margin. That is, by controlling managers' remuneration and so wealth accumulation, managerial compensation contracts help solve the conflict of interest between managers and firms. But they do so precisely by rewarding those managers who are successful with wealth increments that move closely with their firm's fortunes. While taxes then have a very detrimental effect on an economy, whenever they distort, as I'll show you they do, in, they would in the US economy, whenever they distort the contractual alignment of firm and manager incentives, because they discourage this way, managers from pursuing high risk and high return ventures of value to society, therefore exacerbating agency friction and depressing output and productivity as a result. So in the rest of my time today, I will discuss the current evidence on income and wealth inequality in the US. I will examine historical evidence on the US tax burden. There's a lot of confusion in some of the current tax debate about it. I will describe the model that we propose to evaluate the impact of wealth taxes. I will review, as Jonathan asked, the recent experience of OECD countries with these taxes, and I will then examine the impact of alternative wealth tax proposals, including Senator Warren's proposal, in the context of the U.S. economy. Elena, could I, just before where, where we're going, um, when you account for the difference between, say, U.S. and European measured wealth inequalities, is that um, because we are taxed less, because, or we're more innovative? What, why is Europe less unequal than the US in, in your reading of the model, through the lens of the model? Well, the, through the, so let, let me, then we are exactly getting to the bottom of this as much as we can. So one thing to say is that most OECD countries are not as rich as the United States. And Norway and Switzerland, who are the closest, which are the closest country to the United States, rely on a very different um, type of US economy. So but Switzerland is a unicorn in a way that is, that is obvious. And Norway, I mean, traditionally, these are countries that have adopted a lot more redistributive systems that we know they do place a burden on output and growth over time. So these are economies that have solved the trade-off between output and redistribution in slightly different ways that we do. Mm -hmm. But they also rely on a very different, let, let me put it this way, the US economy in the sense of our model is, a, is an economy that especially in terms of the vitality, centrality of the entrepreneurial activities too. Yeah, but wait, wait, there's, so, you know, there's Ikea and, and Nokia and stuff in, in the other countries, and you're looking at pre-tax income anyway. So now we'll look at post. They, I will look in the, in the analysis that follows, I will look at pre but, and post. But, but and so you- The thing is they, they killed their entrepreneurs. Which yes, is a bit. Okay. The level of progressivity of those systems, and you'll see, the, the question of how much you want to redistribute, of course, is a, is, is a matter of political preferences, but an economic fact is that the amount of redistribution that this country chose has taken a toll. Okay, good.
Hey, hey can I uh, stick in one uh, stupid question that, so, so intuitively I have a problem. If you think about like in the US, right? The guys who are driving the, the data to like such extremes are basically founders uh, who were both owners and managers. I'll uh, get to that, uh, Kevin. I, I don't see okay. you. I, I presume it's you, Kevin, right? That's me. Yeah, it's me. It's Kevin. Yeah, I'm sorry. And, and, and yes. so the issue is that how is there an agency problem? If, with I this? will tell you. I will tell you. I'll, I'll, I'll turn. I want to give you a sense of exactly right now about very much the facts that you bring uh, to bear to the table. So, and my okay. argument will be that a lot of the people that you uh, are mentioning and you have in mind, we all have in mind, are entrepreneurs who really became rich once they became managers of firms after the IPO. The stage in which the, the entrepreneur becomes rich in the data, statistically speaking, is when the firm is successful enough to have gone public. So in their role of manager rather than entrepreneurs of this it, it is the mark to market value of founder stock as opposed to earnings or accumulated bank accounts or things like that. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. But the, let, let, let me go to the facts that hopefully speak to the question that you have. So let, let me just postpone it by one slide and we'll talk in, on based on the SE, SEF data that we have. And you see that the stand that we take vis-a-vis -vis the data, we, we, which we think is very much consistent with what we see, but it's really coming right here. So the debate, so just give me, give me a sense to give you, first of all, the backdrop. So what are the degrees of inequality that we are talking about here? And where does it come from? So to start with, which is, I hope, partially an answer to your questions, if you parse out the income sources of those at the top of either the income or the wealth distribution, we do so using SCF data between 89 and 2016. The first important fact is that wages and salary account for 50% of it. Business income is a mere 14%, other sources of income are negligible. And the same holds true for those at the top of the wealth distribution. So a very large fraction of income of those in the top 1% of both distributions, not capital income, it's labor income. These are individuals who work towards the income they earn. The second fact that Kevin was uh, mentioning, which is what are their occupation? Well, the fraction of those in the top 1% of the income distribution who are managers, and that's why I wanted to be clear. So we are only able to define managers based on what the public SCF is allowing us to do, but we're in the process of acquiring the, pub, the private records. But if you consider managers as all of those in managerial and professional specialty occupations, that's a 75% of everyone in the top 1% of the income distribution. It's 65, so only a little bit lower in the top 1% of the wealth distribution. Well, isn't there a fat tails problem here? So the average person in the top 1% is a, a, a doctor, a surgeon, but the average dollar of wealth is, uh, one, is the what is the 0.001% who have billions and billions. You have to go for, if you think about the 400 billionaires, Forbes billionaire, you have to go to the very, very top of the tail. In fact, I think that one of, I mean, the, the debate is framed a bit confusingly to us because a lot of people talk at the top, about the top 1%. But if you go down to the top 1.1%, the picture is the same. It's only when you go to the top 0.001 that the Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos of the world, which to us still are managers. So let me just give you the breakdown and then I'll, I'll open to any further remarks on the matter. If you think about entrepreneurs, the way that typically they are intended, meaning self-employed, active business owners, they are, of course, an important chunk, 47%. But entrepreneurs who are not managers are only 8% or 11% if you look at the top 1% of the wealth distribution. So John is right that, of course, there's a thinning. There's a thinning of the distributions, but this picture is consistent. So many of those in the top 1% of the distribution they may have been entrepreneurs alone in the past. They may currently be entrepreneurs as well, but they are more certainly managers in the way that will make uh, clear how we interpret it. So to reiterate the point, we interpret this evidence. So what do we take from this evidence? We take from this the notion that a large fraction of those in, at the top 1% of both the income and wealth distribution uh, earn their income from labor. 
most of them are managers. And let me let me tie back to the discussion of entrepreneurs. Even if you think about the famous cases of Bill Gates and Paul Allen, individuals who became famously rich, they became so by holding their wealth in one stock, in the stock of one company, which they helped manage once the company went public. So if you really believe, but it's really not a complete picture that all of the rich people are entrepreneurs, they are not in the top 1% and 0.1% sense, but a lot of them really become rich and currently are rich in their position as managers. And this is what our model is meant to address. What to do, I mean, is it appropriate, useful, and advisable to redistribute resources through wild taxes and economies when individuals who are rich generate values uh, by being managers? Elena, could I ask your thoughts? Um, so there's both demand and supply. This is something Kevin Murphy keeps uh, emphasizing on the skill premium in general. Absolutely. Yes, there's an increase in demand for skilled people, but the premium only goes up because people refuse to go to college and supply more skills. So you must have in mind, is, is, what's the limit on supply of good managers that generates this extraordinary premium? So this is, I mean, the, the increase in the skill premium is the phenomenon in, in labor economics, uh, which is clearly at the, at the center of the debate on equality. But I'm gonna talk about it, the equality at the very top. And for this reason, I wanna show you the simplest possible story behind it because our purpose is really addressing, as of today, the debate on wealth taxes. So we're gonna abstract from any differences that you're talking about, but we'll capture it to the extent that managers will be the skilled group of individuals in the economy whose labor services are complementary to labor, so to, to capital. So if I were to rephrase your question, what we know that a lot of the inequality among workers, among laborers in general, has been driven by the skill premium. The skill premium has come about because of the greater complementarity between skill workers and capital and the increasing substitutability between capital and low skilled labor. And we will have this feature in the model, but I'm not gonna talk about the skill premium per se. I'm not gonna talk about dynamics at all, even if, as I mentioned, this framework is capable of addressing it. So, to conclude what our understanding of the data in terms of the statistic that I briefly showed you, to us, understanding the determinants of managerial compensation seems important in the first order sense to understand the determinants of income and wealth inequality, which, as I argued, within the economics profession is an open question. But is it an open question how taxes affect output of productivity? Perhaps not to this audience, but very much so, and apparently so in the context of the current debate, for instance, in labor economics. So to make the point clear, I'm going to show you uh, some evidence about the uh, historical evidence on the US income tax burden. So what's the debate? It's often claimed that the US has experienced periods of very rapid growth when the top marginal income tax rates were much higher than the current level. And this is really the background of some of the proponents of the most progressive wealth tax schedules. But we document here, I'll show you a couple of pictures that based on public IRS data, we can conclude that this argument is incorrect. In that for those at the top of the income distribution, even when statutory marginal tax rates were very high above 80%, the effective rates were much lower especially during the post-war economic expansion between 1950 and 1970s. So the slides I'm gonna show you with this striking picture, I have to say, are based on the notion of adjusted gross income that the IRS uses. But our results are robust to other measures of income. As a reminder, the IRS defines adjusted gross income as gross income minus adjustments like educator expenses, student loan interest, alimony payments, and contribution to retirement accounts. The notion of gross income is very broad as it includes wages, dividends, capital incomes, business income, retirement distribution. So this figure shows you the time series between 1950 and 2016 of the statutory top federal marginal income tax rate in the US, as well as, and this is the blue line, the red line in the figure instead represents the effective average burden on the top 1% of the income distribution of each such year, 
measured as the ratio of total tax liabilities to AGI. The difference between the red and the orange line is that we computed the red line, the affected average tax rate, based on public but aggregate IRS data. The orange line is computed based on the public IRS microdata. But as you can see, really the conclusion is the same. The effective average burden on the top 1% was much lower than the statutory one. So the marginal tax rate exceeded 80% between 1950 and 1960s. On the contrary, the effective average burden is roughly 30%, computed either based on the aggregate or the microdata the IRS makes available. And it's rather stable over time. So if you dig in deeper and look at the effective marginal tax rate, which we do here, where I contrast once again, the statutory top marginal income tax rate, the blue line with the effective marginal tax rate, you see that a similar conclusion arises. So what this picture shows you is our attempt at constructing the effective marginal tax rate, which we do through a finite difference approximation two ways. So we compute, and this is the red line based on the public aggregate IRS data, and the orange line is based on the public IRS microdata. We compute the effective marginal top income tax rate on the top 1% of the income distribution as the ratio of the difference in average liability to the difference in average AGI. First, by looking at the yields on the top 1% and 5% of the income distribution. And this gives you the red line and the orange line. But we do the same, meaning we recompute this ratio of difference in average liabilities to the difference in average AGI for those at the top 2% and 1% of the income distribution. So we approximate the derivative through these finite differences, comparing those at the top 5% and 1% and those at the top 2% and 1%. And when we look at the 1% and top 2%, we get this gray line here based on the aggregate IRS data and the green line based on the aggregate sorry, on the IRS microdata. But the purpose of this picture is that these lines are almost indistinguishable and they imply an effective marginal top tax rate of roughly 35%, much lower than the statutory rate, and once again, fairly constant over time. So to us, these pictures are striking because to summarize, they imply Lena, that we have, yes. So just a I don't think it matters for the allocation over time, but we should not forget that the economically important marginal tax rate is not just federal income tax. Yes. It has state and local, which has risen a lot over time. Uh, sales tax has to go in there. The state tax has to go in there. All sorts of... So I, I totally buy your point that the statutory rates were not that high, but to say that the U.S. only taxes its rich people at no. 40% is not no, right. No, 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 no. So it, this is a very important distinction. Right, John, we, we, we are following the thread of the debate. So our claim, you'll see, we're going to count for, well, for today, I'm going to count for federal, state, and payroll taxes only, but we are in the process of augmenting our analysis with sales tax too. But the point that we wanted to make is that the very premise of individuals who support world taxes saying that if you look at the historical evidence on income yeah. taxes that have been there for a long time. No, I, I agree entirely. It's just- I, I, We just yeah. wanted to make sure that, to, and we, we wanna be careful. And this picture, we are engaging actually in, uh, in, uh, in actually a vast attempt of digitalizing the, the, the record, the paper records that we have for these taxes. So I hope to be able to tell you more about sales and state level taxes too. Uh, at some point soon. But the point we want to make, because the debate, quite frankly, is fraught about these issues. The point we wanted to make is that we have no experience of the highly progressive taxation that some propose, contrary to what many claim. In particular, we do not have evidence that high marginal tax rates do not depress output, let alone that greater redistribution through progressive taxation stimulates output or growth. That's where we wanted to start with. So it's absolutely unclear whether and that's the case. I would put the current high-end marginal tax rate around 70%. Greg Menke thinks it's 90% already. So we do have, no, and the US has the most progressive tax system of every other country. So I just, the, the, the letter of the law of what you said there, I, I think is a little bit misleading. I see. How would you rephrase it? 
what is a statement that you will feel well, comfortable you, you with? We have no experience of highly progressive taxation. We, we already have what size and company advocate. We have a 70 to 90% high-end marginal tax rate. Uh, right. if you count all the taxes together. So we have experience. No, that is absolutely true. Things could be even better, and things are even worse in Europe. But that right. doesn't mean that we don't don't say that we don't have experience of highly progressive taxation. No, no, no. I'm saying that we don't. So this, my, my, say, you're absolutely right. I, un I understand the debate between pre and post all taxes and transfers. I wanted to just keep myself on the narrow because usually the rejoinder is after a statement like yours. Yes, but look at. Uh, income taxes only. If you just look at income taxes, they've been extremely successful. And when they were the most yeah. redistributive is when we experienced the fastest growth. I, I so completely agree with your it's that's the, It's that, that second side, because I think all of us, so regardless of your position in the debate, we all agree, I hope we all agree with your statement. But the second step is where the divergence starts. That, However, once you restrict attention to top income tax rates, the picture is quite different. It isn't. That's yeah. all what we wanted to say. Elena, it's very much I, consistent what you say. Yes. Elena, a qu question about your picture of the top marginal tax rates over time. Do you, do you have the capacity? In the, I don't know how much of this is driven by a large share of people collecting capital gains. Oh, that's a good question. Years. Do, you, do you have the capacity in the data to reconstruct these marginal rates when you isolate taxpayers who get most of their income from something other than capital gains? Yes, we are. I mean, the details, yes, this is precisely what we're trying to do right now, even if it's a bit cumbersome really to go over the archive, the Sorica, um paper archive records because they are very difficult to read because we have itemized uh, exactly information like the one you suggest. But let me give you what we know now. What is certainly true, I'll give you uh, a paradigmatic case, which is 1958. In 1958, most of the people at the very top actually were entertainers. So, to give you a sense, like the, I could talk for hours, but let me keep it short. So in 1958, the CEO of US Steel gained in 1958 dollars, earned $300,000, whereas Frank Sinatra, and he was not the 0.01 percenter, earned 4 million, so 35 million in current dollars. Most people at the time, you're right, they were, so a lot of reasons are behind this difference if you care to know about it. So the accelerated depreciation of income earning real estate, the fact that most people, uh, the top earners actually uh, were paid through collapsible corporations. They were subject to the, a top corporate tax rate that was 50% what the income tax rate were 90%. And also there was, uh, anyway, there were these oil dwelling provisions. There were a lot of deductions that are responsible for this. So in short, yes, capital gains was, was a huge reason for Elena, um, the discrepancy. Elena, the question. So how much of what we're seeing is just that the stock market has gone up like crazy and interest rates have gone down. And at, at the time the stock market was low. So of course, people who own stock weren't one percenters. Now people who own founder stock are, have an immense amount of boost just because the stock market went up. Uh, so to what? It... So my argument is that the cap capital gains matter very much early on, uh, and not just later on. In fact, I mean, all I can say today is if that helps. Is that if you look at the same picture, subtracting or including capital gains, you get very similar pictures. That's all I wanted to say. So my answer, I don't know if it wasn't clear. So there is a reason for this gaping difference between the two lines, which I was trying to give Steve. And if you account for capital gains, they matter very much here too for the top 1%. They matter very much early on too. So it it's not what drives um, the time series that you see. They're not confounding effects. Is that what you're thinking the, the, of? Elena, just, just as a tax guy, the, the, I, and I know you know all these details, I was just going to say for everybody, to the left of 1986, Things like yes. passive loss rules made it so the marginal rate was a fiction uh, and, and, and that you could do stuff so that you didn't have to pay it. Sort of to the right of 1986, the top marginal rate is about the top marginal rate, <laughs> you know, just right. about because you actually have to pay it and the passive loss rules don't work it, it, it anymore. And, and, and so the, the left part of the chart is, is it's, it would be different, right, if you had a 90% rate for every in, for income above yes. $90,000. 
uh, that everybody has to pay. That's fair. Right. Or, or if you have a 35% rate for a hundred, you know, for the whole chunk of money. And, 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 and so what happened to the left is that you just didn't have to pay it to the right. You do have to pay it. And, and so I think that the people who use the left to make a political point like Bill Gale, they're just being deceptive. And, and so that's really what your point is too. Yes, but, exactly, exactly. So of course there's lots behind this because this relatively stable time series as you Kevin, you're mentioning is masking the fact that really the way we pay taxes, the tax base, uh, the structure of the deductions, I completely agree. This are a very different world. I'm just saying that the contention that I always hear is not accurate. Now, Elena is not what you're talking about today, but I think this picture is, is just a hugely important picture in terms we of- We think so. But also, not just the point you're making, but in terms of political economy, you know, you can think we'll tax the rich, right? But whether the rich actually pay those taxes, you know, there's always some way of getting around it if you put enough incentives to in front of them, right? And if you're taxing them at 80%, the incentives are huge, right? And the inability, I think, of our country, of any country, to truly appreciate this, you know, your pictures, that's just unbelievable. Because even after 86, the, the marginal rate goes up, but it still stays flat. I mean, it's remarkable. So there are two parts to it, Jonathan, if I can interject. So one part, and we're talking about it, it's, it's the issue of ta tax avoidance by the very rich. But what I want to spend a lot of time, not a lot of time, but some time today is even if, because that's what I hear, even if somehow, but I'll show you that historically nobody has been really able to effectively implement these taxes. But even if you could, what the model I'm going to show you sheds light is that at their very core, there is a trade-off between redistribution and output that makes this a very ineffective and punitive way while taxes to distribute resources that as a result raises very little revenues at great cost for those way below the top 1% of the income distribution. So there are two sides to it. They're extremely difficult to implement and I will show you in which sense, but fundamentally they are very imperfect redistribution, redistribution instruments. So uh, their appeal is, is rather questionable. So I don't have to convince you that our whole point is that if you ask me, do we have a theory, an established theory of income wealth inequality? No, we don't yet in economics. Do we know, as some people say, don't we all know what the impact of taxing income wealth is? No, we don't. We don't know that either. And what I'm going to do for the next few slides, I'll show you very briefly what is the model we're thinking about uh, to address what I just showed you, which is going to show you and hopefully in a very stark and transparent way the danger of introducing wealth tax systems without understanding the origin of the survey income and wealth inequality. So before plunging into the formalism of the model, I just want to give you a gist of how it all works. So our model will revolve very simply around a key incentive problem. The stands for the fact that it's relatively easy to monitor workers, but it's quite difficult to monitor and provide incentives to managers. It's the old conundrum who monitors the monitor. However, manager actions, as we know, are critical to firms productivity and returns. For these reasons, managers are provided with incentives by linking their compensation to firm performance through bonuses, share, stock options, and similar. That is, managerial compensation is structured so as to provide incentives that work by concentrating rather than diversifying managers' portfolios. Technically, I will assume that a manager's effort is unobserved to capture the spirit of observed managerial compensation contracts, which you'll see that give rise to a level and variability of managerial compensation that will drive wealth and equality in the economy. So, the economy we're thinking of consists of workers, managers, and financial intermediaries, where workers supply observably labor services, managers provide unobservable labor services that are called effort, and financial intermediaries act by contracting managerial services, hiring workers, and purchasing capital in order to produce. Output is produced using managerial capital and labor service according to a very standard constant elasticity of substitution production function 
that, as we discussed, features complementarity between capital and managers. That's why managers are special in this economy. H and HM and HL, just a few pieces of notation, stand for worker, manager, sorry, and workers' human capital at the beginning of any period. K is the amount of physical capital used in production. And the product of the human capital managers and workers with Z, their productivity, gives the effective managerial labor supply, respectively, of workers, of managers, sorry, and the workers that a manager supervises. I will so focus today on a very simple version of this model in which agents are either born as workers or managers and transit probabilistically between these two states, but our full model accounts for the fact that, of course, agents can choose at any point in time whether to be managers or workers. So managers in this economy are characterized in any period by a given amount of assets and wealth. And this is key. They privately choose effort that affects the distribution of their productivity in a first order stochastic dominant sense, in that the greater the effort a manager exerts, on average, the higher their productivity. They accumulate human capital when employed, and both their productivity and assets are publicly observed to capital markets and financial intermediaries. So managers and financial intermediaries enter into a relationship they're disciplined by compensation contracts given by pairs that consist of a wage and an end of period wealth level. So just a comment, a brief comment, notice that I'm restricting attention to one pair of contracts here, but this is without loss because we are assuming that both managers, financial and intermediaries can walk away from any existing arrangement. That is, intermediate, if intermediaries and managers can freely terminate an existing contract, we show that an optimal longer term contract, that's what you have in mind, can be implemented through this sequence of one period contracts. But how to understand the managerial compensation contract that I just described to you? So intermediary here compensate managers with wages and wealth that depend on their productivity. So as to balance on the one hand and desire to incentivize managers to work and exert effort against an attempt on the other hand to ensure them partially against productivity risk. According to the standard trade-off between risk and incentives, characteristic of moral hazard models. But what is non-standard here is that since it is optimal to tie a manager's compensation to his productivity, we endogenize the feature that the effective return on a manager's wealth, which is the ratio of the end of period, beginning of period assets, has an idiosyncratic component to it that is based on a manager realized productivity. This is the key feature that will allow us to generate an, empir an empirically plausible wealth distribution. Workers are very similar, meaning they exert effort, but their effort is observed. They enter any period with a given amount of assets and wealth. They choose this effort, they affect their productivity, and they accumulate human capital when employed. But crucially, as I briefly mentioned, managers and workers differ in their contribution to output. Managers are complementary to capital, whereas workers are substitute for it. There's plenty of evidence, going back to the, the evidence on the skill premium over time, behind this formulation. So that a contract for work is very standard, simply consists of a wage that is paid to the worker each period, to a worker each period, for each realized level of productivity. I want to stress that this economy is fairly simple. So what I'm going to show you really is, is, is straightforward once you think about this incentives of really being at the core of how values and returns are generated in these economies. So for the matter of financial intermediaries, therefore, what they do is fairly simple. Given the rental rate on capital and labor, they choose the amount of capital and labor for each manager in order to maximize their profits. And they do so by solving the corresponding profit maximization problem. We don't assume any other friction in this economy. So the market for intermediary is perfectly competitive. There's free entry. So the expected profits for in financial intermediaries will be zero in equilibrium. So the manager and workers problems and the equilibrium are defined in a very standard way. So unless you have questions about it, I'd like to uh, step over and aside the formalism of the structure to give you a concrete sense of how our model works and how we generate wealth and income inequality. So consider a very simple case of this economy, assuming that we are in partial equilibrium. So the rental rate on capital and labor are given. 
and the low motion of human capital is even simpler, just a simple linear function. But importantly, I will retain the same utility uh, preference structure that we have in the general model. So managers and workers have constant relative risk aversion preferences in consumption and leisure. So the preferences I will talk to you about are consistent with a balanced growth path for this economy. So everything really hangs together. In the simple partial equilibrium version of the model with only managers, I'll show you how this model generates a thick right tail for the distribution of wealth. And this will be because a manager's compensation contract implies an increasingly large spread in wealth. So for this version of the model, in fact, it's easy to show that a manager's value from entering into a contract with a financial intermediary is a certain form that importantly implies that wages and managers' wages and assets grow over time proportionally to current assets. If human capital and assets over time grow approximately the same rate. So why this is very important? Well, because as you can see, wages grow with assets and current future assets grow with current assets, depending on a manager's idiosyncratic productivity. So this model gives rise to endangers in complete market in that the co-movement of consumption and wealth with productivity is only due to incentive reasons. If yeah. I strip out, sorry, just yeah, let me conclude the thought. If we strip out the incentive, the agency problem from this economy, consumption will be constant over time. It will be back to the textbook consumption saving problem. The accumulation of wealth will be undistorted. So in particular, what I want to focus attention here that optimally, managers are made not to diversify because their wealth accumulation is tied to their productivity. Please Could I ask you the, how you think of the standard problems with this kind of model, which is, um, especially since we're talking about managing a publicly owned firm, uh, yes, the optimal contract says your wealth should depend on your productivity, but the guy still has the incentive uh, and desire to, um, uh, to, uh, uh, to hedge that. And it's fairly easy uh, to sell your company stock, to buy options against your company stock, to get a rate of return swap against your company stock. Um, um, so why do we not, yet, yet they seem to be all in. They, there doesn't seem to be much demand for these services, but nonetheless, there should be. Uh, how, how do you, or this is the privately, uh, the private savings thing that undermines a lot of dynamic optimal contracts. I'm just yes. curious how you think about that problem. So you are at the core uh, of of what we're doing and what's being, well, as you know, this is a frontier corporate finance. So we are taking here, this is a very simple version of the models. I'm taking the model in the starkest form where we take the view that when you are in this capacity of managers, top executive really here, you really can't do that. There's divesting clauses, uh, non-compete clauses. So we're taking the extreme, for simplicity, the extreme view that financial intermediary, board members, firm owners, capital markets, the way you want to call it, really can control your portfolio. You can claim, well, that's not true. What I'm saying is going to carry through as long as to some extent, capital markets can control your wealth. And we claim that to some extent they can through all this business of stock option, asset grants in general, shares, to some extent, financial markets and we want to provide a story for why they do so. And that's quite frankly, John, that's the only story out there, ours, that can give you a sense of what, how we can explain existing income and wealth inequality. Because if you were, if you, if you take the opposite view, well, I, I actually, if you, I, John, were to take the opposite view that every such risk can be hedged, we don't have any single framework that can explain income and wealth inequality. So I'm taking yeah, I'm, I'm this as a working assumption and perhaps not as an unreasonable approximation, because then the question that begs to be asked is, why would you reward, if you know that these people can undo everything, why would you bother rewarding them through, uh, in ways that-, no, that move it That makes sense, and, and we're just, sorry. But I take, I took the logical extreme, for simply the logical extreme where imagine, which is the opposite of what people assume. People are usually assume that you, there's no way that your portfolio can be really controlled. No. Let's see where it takes us to assuming the opposite. This and makes total sense. And in fact, the puzzle isn't so much the managers where you're, you're right. There's 
all sorts of constraints on them selling. The puzzle is that after they retire, why is Bill Gates still yes. invested in Microsoft stock? But that has nothing to do with your uh, your your paper. So we'll not we'll for move today. On. I don't have to say much about that as of now. So this is, as John remarked, a very very simple framework, but it really illustrates the core idea that we are trying to push through. So notice that the key, so another crucial dimension that I, I, I was trying to point out is that literally future assets depend on current assets via, they are mediated through this slope function that is a function of the manager productivity. So to put it differently, this commitment of future assets with current assets or productivity is uh, a very important dimension here. And the reason is that as I just repeated the expression from the previous slide, since future assets, as you can see, grow, future assets, A prime, grows linearly in current assets. Wealth undergoes a compound growth with a prepared growth factor that co-moves with the manager's stochastic productivity. But then if assets and human capital grow at the same rate approximately, then the randomness in Z implies that well technically follows a geometric random work process, which as is very well known generates an arbitrary degree of inequality in the distribution of wealth. We derive a bounded stationary distribution of wealth by introducing death for workers and managers. And that's how in a nutshell, the model is capable of producing a stationary wealth distribution that matches the absurd one with a very high degree of concentration at the very top wealth. So to some of you in the audience, this result may be reminiscent of the standard logic of portfolio choice problem, and it is. This result extends really the logic of Merton and Samuelson portfolio choice model 1969, where they considered a consumer with relative risk aversion preferences, and they showed that such a consumer would invest a fixed proportion of wealth in a risk and in a safe asset, with a factor of proportionality that depends on the stochastic return to it, so that the resulting wealth distribution would exhibit an arbitrarily large degree of dispersion. Our resulting form is similar, as you may have noticed, but the intuition is very different. Due to moral hazard consideration, an optimal managerial contract in our context links a, metric, a manager future asset holdings with a manager current productivity, hence endogenously gives rise to stochastic returns on wealth, which are instead taken as given in Merton and Samuelson's model. So the same argument applies to the distribution of income, but in the data I mentioned the distribution of income as a much thinner tail than that of wealth. So how can our model explains it? So the answer is simple. Let me give you the intuition. This happens, the income distribution will always be less concentrated than the wealth distribution if future assets grow with current assets at a faster rate that wages increase in current assets. When is that the case? Well, that happens whenever the consumption is not very variable in productivity. But why would you have that as an outcome in an economy plagued by moral hazard issues? Well, this happens whenever it is difficult to infer a manager's effort from his realized productivity. So the moral hazard problem is hard to solve. In the language of Milgram 81, this is whenever high level of productivity do not convey much of good news about effort. A financial intermediary is unable to tell whether a manager worked hard or simply was lucky. In this case, a steep wealth accumulation path is useful to support effort incentives. The financial intermediary is two instruments, wages and assets. It will use both whenever it's hard to provide incentives. And the idea is that by controlling a manager's assets, what John was alluding to before, an intermediary can fine tune the variability of compensation within and across periods. Since an intermediary can now reward a manager's high productivity through increases in current or future consumption. So the intermediary can reduce the variability of a manager's current consumption by asset grants and thus provide incentives at much lower cost. This intuition extends to the general model now I hopefully convince you that this model can explain what we see, does it? So we parameterize the model in a very standard way, matching the income profile of managers and workers in the PSAD, setting the parameters of our production function so as to reproduce the income share of managers and workers, and matching the probability of transition, people do transit from worker and manager positions and vice versa. But of course, the key dimension here is to account for the progressivity 
of the current U.S. and tax transfer system. Just one second, Steve. It is straightforward to embed taxes in this environment. What's less straightforward is how to account in our quantified version of the model for the true level of progressivity of the U.S. system. Please, Steve. Yeah, I thought one of the standard problems with this kind of models is that executive compensation isn't high powered enough in the sense that managers are often rewarded for things over which they appear to have no control, like general movements in the stock market, as opposed to the relative performance of their firm in particular. And is that, is that an incorrect reading of, of, of this kind of model and what it implies? So in this kind of, yeah, so in what this kind of, yes or no, in a way, what this model implies is that you should compensate, and that's what you, I mean, what the literature, the modern literature, the modern, the current literature on executive compensation, you should reward uh, managers for any portion of abnormal return that they have any responsibility generating. And so the question is the practical difficulty of distinguishing between the two. But the notion is that you definitely should not reward for any Aryan movement in stock prices, any particular manager. That's, I think, uh, I mean, a valid point that you raised, but but certainly understood. Yeah, but isn't isn't it the case? Uh, I'm just revealing my ignorance about the structure of executive contracts. I thought many of the executive contracts um, were of the form that managers often got rewarded handsomely or penalized for for things over which they had no control and that's so uh, i way. have in mind uh, i have in mind a number of papers from 2000 i mean what you're saying is very true but i there is a strand of literature i would say from the end of the 2000s where if you really under, i mean there was a lack of data but if you really parse through the details of actual compensation conference you can through the stf SEC filing for the top five paid executives of a company, they take great pains in really trying to reward for the component that the manager has control over. You know, I mean, I don't want to derail. But, but other people in this audience may know a lot more, of course. I don't, I don't want to derail the conversation here, but you realize there's a red queen issue here, right? In other words, in a very competitive environment, if everybody works hard, and as a result, they cancel all the efforts. Everything moves together. But if you uh, didn't yeah, move sure. hard, so you know, it's not that simple just to say if if my if my stock price goes up with the market, that was not the manager. It's, it's, it it's more, actually yeah, an extremely right. complicated question as to what the manager's addition ab is. So anyway, it's a very aside point. So I don't no, no, this is, I, I'm not under, under uh, in, in any way, understating the importance of Steve's question. And I, my understanding is that the accounting literature is, is actually, uh, I mean, it's, this is a very important debate and open research question accounting. What I'm saying, so in this environment, as you say, I mean, all, the, there's no notion of any aggregate risk. Uh, so you're really rewarded for what you do because all risk is idiosyncratic. But I took Steve's question saying, but isn't it, there a debate out there to what extent contracts manage to remunerate managers for their own effort vis-a-vis -vis whatever market forces are lifting all boats up? That's, that, that's a good question. But my understanding is that compensation contract, I understand, financial intermediaries, sorry, firm owners understand that. And contracts are to a larger extent structured to parse out the two. How much is the manager's contribution versus market forces largely outside of their control? I asked a question about the time. You you promised a bunch of info about Europe, history of Europe, yes. applications so in Europe. Me, and you got uh, like right. 18 minutes left. So let me move that. I just want to uh, um, briefly comment on the notion that the US tax and transfer system is highly progressive, as some noticed. And you can see by comparing the income distribution before and after taxes, it entails very large negative average tax rates, a low percentile of the income distribution of the order of 60%. We incorporate this tax and transfer system in our quantified model, and we incorporate it in a way that matches evidence by Otten and Splinter on the degree of progressivity of the actual system. So we have simply approximate the tax and transfer system through a very flexible schedule that we augment our model with. And when we do so, let me not spend too many words here, but when we do so, we find that our model is very successful at reproducing observed income and wealth inequality at the very top. We match really digit by digit, essentially, uh, wealth and income inequality. So, but let me turn to what we were after, after all, which is 
the debate on wild taxes. So I'm gonna turn to examine the impact of wild taxes. And since the US tax system, as we know, does not feature a wild tax, I'm gonna start by reviewing the experience of OECD countries that do levy wild taxes. I will then evaluate the impact of wild taxes similar to those adopted by these countries in the context of the US, as well as the impact of the wild tax proposal of Senator Warren by analyzing and showing you what would happen if the US adopted them. We, let me, a, we have an estate tax, which is actually a fairly significant wealth tax, but go ahead. It's true, but I'm think, let, me, let me tell you, we mean a, a bulk wealth tax. Some what other US countries have that. So let me so begin with- we an, don't have sorry. a wealth tax, we actually do, that's all. So there, I mean, in this literature, I don't know if you take this literature, literature they're called quasi wealth tax, because they are only, uh, they, are, they are taxes that are pertinent. A wealth tax is meant to be added a tax that you paid a tiny oh, point okay. in time on your total net worth. So yep. I stick with the terminology. We got a lot of pushback, so I'm very careful with the language. Well, we have a, we have a tax on wealth. <laughs> That's true. Not according to the CD. I'm, I'm, I'm going through standard definitions. I'll tell you why. Go ahead. So Go what is the international experience? So only three OECD countries currently levy a wealth tax. Norway, Spain, and Switzerland. In each of these countries, the tax provides a trivial percentage of the country revenues. And many other countries are often uh, mentioned in the debate, for instance, Belgium, France, Italy, and the Netherlands, but these countries only impose a minor wealth tax, a very small wealth tax on selected assets only. But many more countries up to the 90s, roughly a dozen had a wealth tax. In the 90s, a repealing wave took momentum. And let me give you, because it's quite instructive, a brief history of the implementation and repeals of wealth tax in taxes among OECD countries. So 13 OECD countries of 1995, Switzerland, Norway, Iceland, the Netherlands, Spain, Sweden, Germany, France, Italy, Denmark, Finland, Austria, and Greece, all had a wealth tax, according to the OECD global revenue statistics. Switzerland, you can see from the second column of the table, was the country that raised the largest tax receipt that yet amounted to roughly 3% of the tax revenues of the year, so very small amount. And Greece was the country that raised the least amount, 0.05% of the tax revenues of the year. Notice that just 10 years later, five countries already opted out. And the reason is really the low amount of revenues and the high cost. I'll talk about it in the next slides. Some of those who kept the tax, look at Netherlands and Germany, famously efficient countries that are raising taxes, the contribution to the tax revenue of the country in the year was minuscule. In fact, overall, if you glance through the numbers of the table, the tax generated a very small amount of revenue that in fact, all countries except for three gave up on them by 2019. Why these taxes tend not to be successful? For three reasons really primarily. The small revenues they raise, the high administrative cost, they entail valuing assets that are not largely traded in private businesses so liquid assets that are very hard to price. And because of the erosion of the tax base they trigger, rich individuals we, in all these countries account for the greatest overall tax burden might, can migrate out and that they do, I'll show you. Also, since this tax is entailed double taxation of the income that has generated the tax wealth, they tend to be unpopular way among those, way much more than among those at the top 1% of the wealth distribution. And this is because that's an important message. In order to generate revenues, you see the case of Norway, Switzerland. This is an aspect lost in a lot of the discussion. In order to generate revenues, these taxes must cut a lot deeper in the wealth distribution than the first percentile. As a result, entrepreneurs, small entrepreneurs and farmers are known to complain offer to be short of the liquidity necessary to pay for the tax. So what our experiments will uncover, you see, is that there is a fundamental trade-off between redistribution and productivity that makes these taxes very costly and inefficient and redistributive resources. But to fix the idea, let me give you a few more details about France, which is a paradigmatic case in many ways. France is a rich, populous, and advanced economy, a country with roughly the same size population economic output as the UK, but unlike the UK and the US, the country has repeatedly experimented with wealth taxes and high top rate income taxes with disappointing results. But you see the history in a way is also entertaining, not just uh, um, instructive. 
In terms of wealth taxes, in 1982, the first left-wing president of France's Fifth Republic, François Mitterrand, introduced a one tax that was abolished in 1986 when a right-wing prime minister, Jacques Chirac, took office. But it was swiftly reinstated back in 1988 when Mitterrand again became president. And this tax on one's fortune, ISF, stayed in place until 2017 when it was abolished by the current president, Emmanuel Macron. The wealth tax was charged on all individuals with a net worth over 1.3 million euros, with a rate that ranged from 0.5% to 1.5% on assets above 10 million euros. But the tax raised very little revenues. In 2015, a total of 343,000 households paid the tax, raising roughly 5 billion euros in revenue for an average of $15,200 per household. So it accounted, not surprisingly, for very small revenue, less than 2% of France's tax receipts. Not only the tax fell short of raising the projected revenues, but it also is widely taught, thought to have triggered an exodus of France's richest. More than 12,000 millionaires left France in 2016. Overall, the country experienced a net outflow of more than 60,000 millionaires between 2000 and 2016, and many have shown that this outflow led to a net decrease in taxes raised because of a significant reduction in revenue, not just from the wealth tax itself, but also from income and VAT taxes. Some have estimated that France's inequality has decreased, but the question is, was France better off? Another attempt was performed in France to tax the rich through the adoption of the so-called super tax. But this attempt too was very short-lived. Introduced by President Hollande in 2012, the so-called French super tax imposed a 75% top income tax rate above 1 million euros. It led to a number of French celebrities leaving the countries, notably France's richest man, Bernard Arnault, who is, you may know is the chief executive of the luxury retailer Mohaid Annecy Louis Vuitton, applied for Belgian citizenship. Interestingly, the tax was finally repealed in 2014, where in an interesting turn of events, the then economic minister of the time was the current president, Emmanuel Macron, warned that he made France Cuba without the sun. So taxes on the rich beside the anodex really tend to raise little revenue, but I'm going to show you it's not just a matter of tax avoidance through migration. I want to spend some time on the trade-off at the core of these taxes. So what I mean by that, I'm going to show you two alternative sets of wealth well tax proposal and understand their impact on the US economy. A common theme to the experiments would be that if their goal somehow, if the goal is to achieve a decrease in inequality, a wealth well tax would do so a great cost in terms of output and consumption across the income distribution, not just on the very rich. I will proceed by evaluating the impact of introducing the United States, the wealth taxes that are currently implemented in Switzerland and Norway. If you're not considered the case of Spain, if you wonder, just because it's a complex state tax that aroused every single of the 17 Spanish autonomous regions to on, impose their own additional taxes reduction allowances. Once we evaluate the impact of the wealth tax proposal of Senator Warren II, you'll see a trade-off will emerge, a consistent message of the experiments between the degree of inequality reduction that these wealth taxes realistically can achieve versus the cost in terms of small revenues and huge distortions introduced as a result. So let me imagine that all of a sudden we decide to experiment and introduce the Swiss tax in the US economy. The wealth tax schedule in Switzerland is the most progressive in the canton of Geneva which can be described as you see here. The tax is imposed on all net worth above the 50th percentile of the pre-tax wealth distribution in Switzerland. We'll do the same imposing, assuming that it's imposed, about the 50th percentile of the US pre-tax wealth distribution. The tax entails a marginal tax rate that ranges between 0.06% right above the cutoff of the 50th percentile up to 0.92%. Once we simulate the introduction of these tax in the US economy, we find that the share of wealth on the top 1% of the wealth distribution declines by one percentage point. The share of wealth at the top 0.1 distribution 
barely changes. It's a matter of very small digits, but output falls by 3%, consumption falls by 4%, and employment declines as well. And the reason, very simply put, uh -huh. Uh, one thing I'm worried about this thought experiment is the following. Because you, it's, it's by Canton, it is relatively easy to leave the Geneva Canton and go to the neighboring Canton, right? Which certainly doesn't apply in the United States. I mean, relatively easy means you drive a mile. Yeah, you but you say, right. I mean, we wanted to be very precise, but all of the Cantons, this is the most progressive, but in terms of the rate of increase of the tax, at the very, very top end of the wealth distribution. All the other cantons have very similar taxes. I just wanted to be precise because some people asked. Grace, so even if you move, the average burden is very similar. Grace, uh, Elena, um, yes. given that the manager is a small part of, there's one manager and there's a lot of Microsoft, um, why in equilibrium does the company not just simply bear the burden of the tax leaving the manager's post-tax incentives completely unaltered. It's not a, this is not a financial burden on the company, really. So let me give you the intuition if that helps. So the intuition- You seem to be having a back the incentives. I'm uh, sorry, you seem to have idea in here. You seem, you seem to be saying that the firm pays roughly the same amount, the manager receives less incentives, he doesn't work as hard, things are bad. But I don't see why the, the firm shouldn't simply pay a higher pre-tax amount and keep the manager's post-tax incentives the same way as they were before. So the question is, uh, is the equilibrium pass through of the tax? Even if it is in, you, you, I mean, you could impose the tax on the firm as well, but it unravels the financial intermediaries. It, I mean, it's costly. The point is that here it's really costly to provide incentives. Not, we yeah. have actually, do, Andy, Andy, can Andy say right. something about being in Switzerland? Andy? So I'll use this second to start answering John's question. Yeah, so no. what happens is that whether the tax is imposed on manager, you can think, or meaning it, it, it is on manager's proceedings on the firms. And we're talking about small percentage point, but the, the way the tax affect returns and does the solution of the moral hazard. I mean, this small amount is just the, the, the comparison between a frictionless and the frictional economy. In fact, if, we, if you didn't have in mind this incentive problems that we have, a tax like this, and I'll show you, would raise a, a decent amount of revenues at essentially no distortion. But the tax unra unravels the, um, the alignment of incentives that compensation contracts manage to create. So even if effort decrease, doesn't decrease by much, but a little bit less effort, there's an amplification effect because of the complementarity of managers with capital. So even if effort doesn't decrease that much, the capital and the productivity of capital decreases substantially. And that's why you have this massive impact of output and consumption overall. Because again, what people always stress is what happens to the very, very top. But what we show is what happens when you reduce capital deepening of the economy and reduce direct productivity. I mean, savings rate decline, returns to saving lower. So the economy bears a substantial cost. The tax, so we talked about Switzerland and is not coming online. So let me, let me move to the last two experiments. So if we were to introduce a Norwegian tax that in response to Jonathan is a simple tax, is a proportional tax that triggers, that is triggered above 1.5 million Norwegian kroners, approximately 180,000 US dollars, and is applied for any net worth above this level at a flat tax rate of 0.85%. So if we simulate the introduction of this much simpler tax and much less progressive results, again, you may not incur in such a large loss, but you do not affect inequality at all. What I mean is that if we simulate the introduction of this tax in the US, the wealth at the top 1% of the wealth distribution would barely decline. The share of wealth at the top 1% would decrease a little bit. But once again, the loss in terms of the aggregate across the income distribution losses in terms of output produced and consumption would be rather substantial for a very small increment in revenues. So really the message from this experiment that you can reduce inequality, but through taxes that you can see cut a lot deeper into the wealth distribution and yet raise little revenues and introduce great distortion. 
The last proposals that we wanted to evaluate is Senator Warren, which, as you all know, consists of a tax on wealth of rate 2 percent on net worth above $50 million that raises to 3 percent for wealth over $1 billion. Now, such a tax, I mean, the question is probably is part of the presidential messaging, would raise a minuscule amount of revenue, 0.1% of output, and not surprisingly, would barely have any impact on inequality. The top 1% of, of, sorry, the share wealth of the top 1% would decrease from 36% to 35.8%. The share wealth of the top 1% of the wealth distribution would decline from 15 to 14.9%. So as I often hear from economic advisors to Senator Warren, the tax would not be very distortive, yes, but would not have much benefit whatsoever either. So it would reduce a negligible reduction in equality. So here, going to John's point, the joint point is that economies like the United States work because they expose managers to risk. Managers individually led the creativity, the grids to select project ideas, commercialize them, but they are risk averse, they are laborers, risk averse individuals and connecting their remuneration to their performance exposes them to risk. So we need to compensate them by offering them certain equivalent argument, high wages, but also highly variable wages. And that will create inequality. With those taxes, we would have a lot fewer millionaires, but a lot less output and consumption. So the intuition for all these results is that a wealth tax entails large losses since it makes, makes it too expensive to induce high levels of effort. So the key distortions are the agency frictions that I laid out. In fact, if we were to consider a model without this moral hazard model that we build on, what taxes would reduce output consumption employment only by very little. So what Emmanuel Saez and others got wrong is that there is an intensive labor supply response to introducing these taxes. In, economy, in our economy with the agency friction, these intense margins of effort would cause output consumption employment to decline as a consequence of the introduction of these taxes. And the reason is that, as I kept on saying, what well, taxes are literally a very inefficient way of redistributing resources. You could raise the same revenues with a trivial, I mean, really a small fraction of percentage one increase in VAT taxes as much smaller cost of the economy if we really wanted to do so. So to conclude, we have proposed a novel framework for the study of income and wealth inequality to account for the distributions of income and wealth in the US. We have shown, hopefully, that this, prom this framework is promising at accounting for observed inequality, and we plan to use as a laboratory to investigate not just what taxes, but an array of alternative system regimes. And as some of you suggested, yes, it's on our agenda, we are trying to account, we aim to account for the increase in measured income and wealth inequality as well. But our preliminary findings that wealth taxes can be highly distortionary for the very simple reason that they discourage productive risk-taking behavior. So we are just about out of time. There's a few questions uh, which maybe we can pass on to you, uh, written form, Ellen, and you get back to people. Absolutely. Yeah, but there are a lot of good questions coming over the chat. In, uh, including the one we just missed from Andy. Uh, Sorry to miss you, Andy. As well. But uh, this is fascinating. A lot Thank to, you. A lot to think about, a lot to work on. So thanks very much for sharing the ideas for, with us. We, we greatly appreciate it.